Um, hey everyone, I'm Kieran Lord. Uh, this is the talk. It's also a terrible tale of despair and finding my path again by Craig Smith. It's me. Okay, so let's get cracking. Uh, first of all, a disclaimer. I submitted the name for this talk back when the idea of Trump running for president seemed funny rather than a terrifying thing that could actually happen. It was too late to change it, so yeah, I'm just sort of living with this now. Um, this talk is going to be really code heavy. Um, my apologies to anyone who's not a programmer in the audience. Um, there's functioning source code for everything covered here on GitHub. Um, so don't, you don't need to take pictures. Everything is fine. Um, these slides are online as well. So I prefer that everyone just uh, focuses on what uh, trying to keep up because this is, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, and finally, this talk is about working around what I find to be the most frustrating things in Unity, and really frustrating. So it's going to be negative. It's going to be entirely negative. So let's just start by saying some positive things about Unity before I start, so we just have something there. Um, first of all, I still use Unity. I use it for nearly everything. Uh, over the last five years, I think I've done two projects that weren't with Unity. It's still awesome, like it's still the main engine I use for everything and it's still the fastest way to get stuff done. Um, and it's still the rec engine I recommend for most people to use for most projects. Uh, generally, I, I, I will recommend something, a technology, based on what you're trying to make. For instance, if you're trying to make a first person shooter that is multiplayer and it needs to have like semi-authoritative um, physics going on, don't use Unity, go use Unreal or something else like that because that's, oh good, we've got microphones working. But for the vast majority of games, Unity is a viable and good option and I do like it. It's just that, well, there are problems and we're gonna find some workarounds for those problems. Um, okay, so about me. Um, I'm Kieran Lord, I'm the founder of the CrateSmith Game Assembly. It's called that because I started the business as a sole trader called Cratesmith and it turned out I wasn't able to register the company name as the same as my sole trader name. So, um, and we're a VR games company located up in Brisbane. Uh, we've done a fun, couple of fun things like hoverboard prototype and uh, generally look, I've done a lot of stuff. I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. Um, I've used Unity for about six or seven of those. Um, at least, I'd say about at least six of those professionally. Um, and I've worked on about everything except for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. So iOS, Android, PS2, PS3, it's a long list. Um, I've used almost all the VR hardware out there as well. I've actually had the misfortune of having to use multiple VR platforms at once on the same project. Um, that's an entire talk into itself, but if you want to find out about doing multi-skew VR stuff, uh, I can talk to you about that later. Um, and I hate two things with a burning passion. <laughs> Spaces as tabs. Okay, Pandemic Studios, I actually went through and removed all spaces as tabs from the entire code base. It took me two days. Fuck, it's gotta be die. Oh yeah, I'm gonna swear during this talk. I cannot help it. Um, so, just, sorry about that. The other thing that gets onto my skin is bad workflows. And specifically, uh, that can mean a lot of things, but what I mean by bad workflows are People lose work or people lose time. It's just inefficient, it doesn't need to be. So if you were in Tony's talk before, he was talking about how a major problem of modern engines is that you step on each other's toes, you have collisions with files, people have to wait for other people to get their work in, things like that. Drives me insane. So that is literally what I'm gonna rant about for the next hour. So what's wrong with Unity now? Okay, um, we could really go to town. Um, like we could just start with Enlighten or Mechanim or like, but we're gonna just, we're gonna focus on the problems that we can fix. So first of all, let's talk about what these problems stem from. Unity started out basically like Game Maker. It was designed to make small games. Like it made games like Velociraptor Safari and Rasta Monkey, little iPhone games, little web games. So it was built for small teams and small games, and it's grown mostly into an engine capable of supporting larger projects, but the workflow and the processes for actually building games inside there hasn't really changed much. And this leads to this problem where 
you've got a small sized workflow. It's designed for one or two people to work with it efficiently and you've got 20 people working with it. So naturally you run into these problems with large teams and large projects that need workarounds that just aren't present in the engine. So the biggest problem with this is Unity was built for the concept that your designer is probably also your programmer or your artist can always throw the asset and the programmer can implement it. Um, most of the Unity games require you have one or more system objects that contain all your game systems in, in every scene or have a system scene loaded or something like that. Uh, this isn't great for people building content because they don't know if they've messed that up. It's a magical box to them. Like for level designers and artists, they generally don't know how these things work inside out. So they shouldn't be worrying about that. They should be worrying, like focusing on how to make good levels or how to make a better player model and just iterating and testing their stuff rather than second guessing if they've done something wrong in the level and what's gone wrong, oh my God. Um, and I take a lot of inspiration for this from the old Doom and Quake, like single game level editors. I did a lot of modding when I was in high school um, and there was just this beautiful simplicity to them all. Like you would just build something and as long as you had a room at a player start location, it would work. It didn't need a huge amount of like system objects and you couldn't accidentally delete the player manager. It was just, it would just work and you could just build content. And there are ways to make Unity work like this, but it's a bit of work. So let's break this down a bit further. Unity systems themselves have project-wide assets and settings. Um, they're easily accessible in code. So you might need nav mesh settings. There's a nav mesh manager and it saves that stuff out from the scene. Um, they mostly store project-wide settings. Um, Unity doesn't provide a way for any of us to set up these things easily. Um, this might not seem like a really big problem. Like people have gotten so used to not having these things that it seems like a, a strange topic to, be, to bring up. But if you've worked on larger games, like especially with teams of 20 people, having this kind of thing missing is just a massive hole. You've got nowhere to put default settings or project-wide configuration. Like does every single coin in Mario need to know that it's 100 points when you pick this thing up or is it a global setting that you tweak in one place? So my personal opinion is that this may have been a very early design decision back when Unity was very small to try and keep everything working one way. If you wanted something, you put it in as a game object. Um, but on larger projects, lack of this thing and the scale that Unity's working at now, it's, it's a pretty crucial thing and it's missing. Um, yes, now I'm assuming everyone knows about this problem and everyone's worked around it. Um, in one way or another. I'm just stating it here because it's one of the major things that has annoyed me for so long. Unity's own tutorials encourage developers to go and put the model inside the prefab and link it into the scripts and just turns into this giant mess. Um, this is like a really simple way to get things working, but what happens is the minute they change the model in certain ways, some ways it'll work. They've just moved a few verts around and stuff like that, but if they've gone and added a new bone or changed other things, suddenly not all their stuff gets put in. Like it doesn't, it doesn't magically get added to the prefab. So, and they don't know how to fix that up. So they've got to then wait for a programmer to come in and fix this in, like basically manually rebuild this prefab. So essentially the, the artist can't iterate on their stuff in engine, which is insane. Um, so the alternative, which I assume that most people here know you to do, is that you add your models to the game and start. You initialize them from a pool or something like that. And that means you only get them appearing in the game when it's playing. So suddenly the level designers lose out. You can't initial add the, um, they can't see the models. You might have icons or you might have a single mesh gizmo or something like that. But it's quite often not a visual representation of what you've got. And like this is actually, a screen cap from a Unity tutorial where, and unfortunately I think it's too small to see, but they've literally just gone and taken the model and then started adding scripts to the model and called it a new prefab. Um, okay, now this is the one, the, the big one for me. Behavior singletons are the single worst thing that you can do in Unity. And I know that a lot of people in this room will be very familiar with their use and they're like, this is nice, it's easy. 
Okay, I have lost more time to errors that appear late in development with behavior singletons. Like, does everyone, is this the same terminology that everyone uses? Like, does everyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, cool. Um, they create these execution order problems that are incredibly hard to find, that only happen late in development. Um, and I admit, like, even I've made a project that had a giant prefab that had all the, um, the singletons in it. It's, it's bad. So common new approach is to have a system scene, and it's, it's a good approach um, because all of your, your prefabs live in one space, the configuration is broken out, but it doesn't solve all the execution problems. In fact, it makes a new one where um, when you're running in the editor, the system scene will often get loaded after the level, or in a build, it'll get loaded beforehand, and those are two very different initialization <laughs> initialization order cases. So I'm not a fan of that approach, although I know a lot of people and it works for them. So I'm gonna propose a complete workaround for having no behavior singletons in your project except for, for some very special cases. And you might be really a bit confused why I've picked these three problems. Like there are many more things wrong with Unity that we could go into. Um, the main thing is, these are the problems that I've had to solve when making larger projects. And specifically, these are the project problems where I've lost significant amounts of time, or other members of my team have lost significant amounts of time to problems that could have been easily fixed by working around these problems rather than just ignoring them. So a small time investment will pay off dividends, especially if it takes a while to solve one of these problems, it, you solve it once and it fixes it across multiple projects. So yeah, it's, it's one of these things. Um, Unity is Unity's a bit of a jerk with these. And so Unity will fix these problems. They're problems with the engine. We'll, we'll get a fix soon, right? won't we? Like some of these are on the roadmap even. Uh, no, not really. Unity has so many developers using it right now that it's actually a problem business-wise. You see, Unity would love, to, the Unity developers, they're not being dicks. They, they, they really aren't. It's, the, the problem they have is that this, these issues cannot be a priority for them right now. Because what their business needs right now is more growth. They need more profit, new ways to get profit. And they've got, they're in almost the entire market. Everyone's using Unity. So they can't go and sell Unity to new people. That doesn't generate more growth for the next year. So they've got to go and look in other places. So they focus on trying to attract new markets like the AAA games industry. So we get features like shadow on shadows on mobile and like PBR rendering, things like that to attract a new market or subscription models like uh, Unity Multiplayer and other features like that. And this is what they need to do. We're, we're actually to blame because we made them so popular before they changed their business model to one that could sustain growth while we're here. So yeah, like I, I constantly, this, I feel like it's a programming joke that only a few people get. You can actually do this. It's perfectly legitimate code. If you ever want to just hijack and like add something like that, feel free. But yeah. Um, Program, solving these kinds of problems won't generate more money for Unity, which is something they desperately need to do from a business sense right now. So until competition gets better, like Unreal's slowly gaining some market share, right now Unity's not afraid of usability problems being their major, like, number one concern. They'll try to fix these things, but they're not the main priority. So we need to fix these problems ourselves um, until Unity actually has the time or a reason to get around to it. So, workarounds. Um, we're going to start with these and just do them in the same order. We list them as problems. So, a home for global settings. Um, what we're really after is a settings asset where we can go and create a menu for it, just like the Unity ones. Um, they need to appear in the menu, which is the easy part. The code on screen there will literally give you It'll select itself. Um, you'll notice it's a weird class called a resource singleton. Uh, I'll go into what those are in a second. Um, and yeah, there must always only be one instance of that asset the project, and it must always exist. Otherwise, that menu item is going to be broken. 
must always be accessible as well. So it's actually, it's a literal singleton asset. Um, using Mario coins as an example again, each coin in the project probably doesn't need its prefab to know how many points it's going to have. It's like a project-wide thing. So this code here is basically, um, it uses a, uh, it might look a little bit weird having a partial class above one of our behaviors. This is a common thing I actually do a lot of. So I break up my settings so that specific classes have um, the settings from the global setting, like large settings assets are actually broken up across all the things that use them and they store their own prefab, sorry, their own settings in their, in their own source file. So the settings for coin pickup, we've got like a serializable structure there um, inside coin pickup and then we use that inside the scoring settings which is going to be its own asset. So it's the, one of those items from here. Scoring settings is this one here that becomes a menu item that's an asset. And the secret to how, um, so yeah, uh, that's basically just the, um, the partial class side of things. But this, the really important thing is how do we go and make and manage this special asset so that we can always access it and it can have a menu item? Um, it's, I hate to say this, but it's actually based off behavior singletons. Um, this is a scriptable object singleton. Um, and what it does is its asset always lives in a resource folder, specifically the same a resource folder that is in the same folder as the script. And what it does is when you ask for it at runtime, it will load itself using resources.load. Um, for those of you who haven't used the resources system, um, you can load an asset from name and these assets are actually initialized as the, the game loads. So don't add too many assets and dependencies there like textures and stuff because it'll slow your initial load down. But for project-wide assets that you will always need in beck and call, it's great for that stuff. Um, so another thing, you may have noticed that the instance property for accessing this singleton is uh, protected. This is a personal preference of mine. I like to access singletons as if they were a static class rather than going like uh, my settings object dot instance dot setting. Um, you're free to do it however you want, that's just preference. Um, and then you might notice also that the, uh, the code to load the asset has an alternate path for if we're not running. Um, this is due to the fact that during several parts of Unity's execution currently, resources.load will just return null. It'll always work when the game's playing, it'll also work when the get, when assets are being imported, but when you're in GUI functions, for instance, quite often it will return null, so you use the asset database calls instead, and that's just what that block is. So it's a workaround for another issue. So that's, that's the resource singleton, but we still need to make these assets. Um, so we have the resource singleton builder. Now I won't drop, drop this code for this thing up on screen because it's a pretty big block of um, uh, reflection code and all the code for this is downloadable in an example project so you can have a look at it later. But generally what it does is whenever you load or import or build or play, it goes through and searches through all the types to find all your resource singleton classes and then if no asset exists for a resource singleton, it'll make one in the correct location. So in this case, we have like these scripts and there are two resource singletons in there. So what it will do, is it'll go and create a resources folder and will create uh, assets for both of those. Now, secondly, if the asset has been moved, like for instance, if the script now lives in a different location, it will move it to the new location just so that you don't lose track of these things. They always live in the correct, like next to their script. So say we move the resources folder out, the minute we press play or reload Unity or anything like that, it'll actually just copy the files from that, well, move them from that resource folder to a new one where they're supposed to be. And it will never delete or overwrite these assets. So that's really important because if you ever do that, you just lost all the stuff that was in them. So just as a version control thing, having, making sure that you never delete or overwrite this stuff is pretty important. Okay, so, that lets us do a couple of interesting things. So in that coin example, all of the coin settings were actually being stored in the global project-wide setting stuff. So what happens when we want to have a coin that has, a, like it deviates from the norm, unlike every other coin in existence? And normally you just say, okay, well that just lives in the prefab. But then every single coin could have a, potentially have a different uh, number of points and you'd have to 
you'd have a testing problem, like what happens if someone accidentally set the points in one scene, finding that. So the approach that I've taken to now is we have a concept called a settings override. So we have our global um, settings object, which is usually a resource singleton. We can store default settings in there. But um, when we want to go and override those settings, we create a separate asset type that can also store those, edit, those settings. So you remember how the coin settings was actually a uh, serializable structure within the class, and then we stored in basically one instance of that in the resource singleton. We can also go and put that one of those instances into another scriptable asset type that we can create at will. And on our behavior, we can now add a parameter that accepts that asset type. And if we have an instance in that parameter, we use the settings from that asset. If we don't have it, we go and use the global settings instead. Um, now this sound, might sound like a huge workaround, but I am going, getting somewhere with this. Um, so just some housekeeping first. Um, Unity just will require that any serializable object or mono behavior, anything that it's going to be able to instantiate, has to be in its own file that matches the type name. So you can't just partial class these things and or store them somewhere else. Um, that's just a little gotcha. Everything else can be used in the partial class pattern. So um, we've got our settings for the global defaults. In this case, I'm using uh, a player character as an example. So the player's got uh, their default settings living in a resource singleton called global defaults. Um, their settings are defined as a subclass inside Active Player, so they've got a model prefab and their movement speed. And then top right, you've got an in also got an instance of those settings in another asset type that we can create from at will. Um, there's you can and basically we've got a property down here for getting whichever settings we have that hasn't like. If we have overridden to the settings, we return the uh, settings from that asset. If we ha don't have one, we go and use the global one. And this means that we always have a valid setting for this because the resource singletons will always exist. That's just a guaranteed contract by the way the builder works. Um, if you want, you can cache the, the correct settings on a wake, for instance. I don't didn't do that in this example just because it'll be an extra step, um, but that's Perfectly valid option. Now, at this point, I, I'm guessing a lot of people are probably thinking this is a lot of work to solve something that doesn't seem like a huge problem right now. But there's a few immediate benefits to this which aren't immediately apparent and they're really quite handy. Um, suddenly, you can share settings with other prefabs. This is like the big one. Suddenly, if you want to have five prefabs that are like dude with shotgun, dude that runs away, um, Previously, you'd have to maintain five different prefabs. Now you just have to maintain minor differences between these prefabs. All of their important settings are now stored in a separate asset that they're all using the same one of, or they're all using default. Um, complex mono behaviors can now operate with default settings. They don't need to specify, like, what's a default player, player model. Normally, the game will just crash if you don't provide a player model. Now there's a default one. It just works. You can literally just put a player character script onto something and it will just work. Um, and that's, that one is a big one for me. Having it so that the game will just work when you put something in um, means that people can figure out how to do things and solve problems without trying to figure out why it's breaking first. Um, and then the, finally, every time you do this, scriptable objects are assets. So they don't get reset when you stop play mode. So if you start doing your configuration this way, you can tweak things while the game's playing, press stop, and it's all saved. You don't have to copy things down or copy the component. It's just, it's just amazing. I, why this isn't the default way to work in Unity is beyond just, I have no idea. OK, <clears throat> so there is a problem with this. Uh, the settings object is currently just a single object field, like that, which isn't very usable. But there's a nice, really easy workaround for this, which is to write a really simple um, property draw. Uh, does everyone know what property draws are? Unity doesn't talk about them much. OK, cool. So um, basically, make a property draw that pops up a little drop-down window that will display the editor for the thing in that field. Um, that, like I said, source code for all this stuff is provided. So you can have a look. It'll drop into your own project just fine. 
Um, it's really quite simple to use. Look, as an alternative, if you don't want to go down that road, there are third-party inspector windows. Advanced Inspector, I believe, can do this for um, any property type. You can just like inspect the, um, the, what it's referencing inside the inspector and just go into it as if it was uh, like part of that object. But I haven't used these myself, used, um, so I can only speak to the efficiency of using this pop-up settings draw. And it's, it's something like setting up is very simple, but you've just got to create like a one line subclass or um, you could also create a settings draw that's partial class and give it lots of uh, definitions. Like basically that attribute for defining the property draw for a particular type cannot be inherited. So you're going to have to do that for every single asset type you want to use this with. Um, demo, cool. So hopefully this works. Um, I've been warned that this lectern hates everybody. Um, cool, there's Unity. So this is a little project I've been using. Um, Righto. So right now we've got this player our character here. He's that active player we were talking about before. He doesn't have any settings right now, so we'll just quickly uh, go and find the game settings that we've created. So global defaults. Uh, I don't have an inspector window. That will be a problem. Um, right. I was doing a lot of moving things around, taking screenshots just before this. I still don't have one. This is, come on Unity, don't be that weird. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm just, I was staring right at it. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, so here, like, he's got his default player model, it's right here, that's what he's getting his appearance from. We'll talk about how he has a player model without actually having a player model, like, uh, anything in the scene for it in a little bit. Um, and secondly, uh, so let's just press play, and he's currently using settings like this. He's got just default movement speed. Let's go and give him a, a, some overridden settings. Uh, it's popped up on the other window, I'll just drag it in. Um, oh, hang on, let me just, I'll just drag this across. So I'll give him these active player settings and uh, he's turned red because uh, he's got another player model. Uh, this is my, the limitations of my art capacity. So what happens is when the settings isn't null, I've got a button here which pops up the extra window and I can just edit it however I want, just play with the settings as if it was there and click away, it's gone. So now he's a much faster and he's using a different model. Yeah, it's, it's not, not pretty, but it's just built to design, uh, show the thing as an example. Okay, so I just need to get, um, cool, all right. And now I need to get it back and this, oh, cool, yep. Whew. Yeah, this lectern hates me. All right, so we've gotten through that. Now in that demo, you saw that there were um, this thing had a model and it was building models, but it didn't actually have the model in the prefab, but you could see it in the scene. So let's unpack that. First of all, simple thing you should just stop doing right now. Don't add your models into your prefabs. It will just, it, there's just too much that goes wrong. Like it is the worst thing you can do to, if you know an artist and you hate them, this is how you, this is how you make their life hell. Um, Secondly, use pooling with pre-allocation to ensure that you don't get performance and allocation spikes when you're allocating these models. So if you're going, when you start at initializing your models for all your objects at startup, make sure that something has already gone through and while the game was loading, gone and created all the instances for these so that you're not instant, like creating them as they go. Um, and now we've got the problem that our objects don't appear in the game, like you can't see the models until you press play. So we're going to fix that. Um, so this is a concept called preview models, and it works by abusing Unity's save process. Um, we actually instantiate a copy of the model into the editor and destroy it whenever Unity is about to save it in any way. Um, so I know the, the obvious place to start for that would be to use objects with, like, just put it in the scene and set everything in the hierarchy to um, hide flags dot don't save. Unfortunately, hide flags dot don't save just means don't save it to the scene. It still saves it to prefabs, so don't do that. It's it's uh, it's not a good. There's just no way to make that work. 
Um, instead, uh, you destroy each uh, game object that's in the model instance by watching its, like by adding a behavior that has iSerialization callback receiver as it implements that. And this function will get called just before it's about to try to save for just about any reason. Um, you also, the only case where it might not catch it is that um, the scene hasn't been changed and it's about to go into play or go into build. In both of these cases, you can catch that by deleting all preview objects in uh, the post-process scene callback. So between these two, you've got a pretty safe catch-all for all the ways that your, one of these models might sneak into the build. Um, so look, I've included the implementation in the downloadable source. Um, basically, it's relatively simple. All you do is you have an object that require components the preview model class, and it implements the iPreview model source interface, and, and essentially that interface will have, make you implement a, a uh, property which will tell it which game object to use as a preview model, and it doesn't really care if it's like a, a, a particle effect or a model or it's a skin mesh renderer. Um, it will work with that. It just, Unity is a, it, this is a bit of a hack, so this is something that may need to be fixed if Unity goes and makes a new revision that changes the way these saving processes work. But I've used it in a couple of projects now, so yeah, the implementation I'm using is kind of stable. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about how this works in detail, uh, please come and talk to me after the talk, because it gets a little bit complicated, and I'd actually need to refer to the source quite a lot to answer questions. Um, if you're planning on building your own implementation, uh, I've got a couple of tips. Uh, making the models not selectable or visible in the hierarchy and adding a gizmo to select them is a really good idea, not because it actually solves any kinds of problems with Unity, but it prevents people from accidentally going in and editing the part of the, um, the game object that's going to be deleted immediately whenever you do anything. Um, it's more of a workflow problem that you might accidentally start configuring a prefab that's not going to exist in a couple of seconds. So, um, and then secondly, test any code you, 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 like this code is something you've got to test a lot before you go and push it into production. Um, any bugs in callbacks, especially the iSerialization callback receiver, are incredibly prone to crashing Unity. Uh, there are just some functions that Unity does not like you calling at this time. Sometimes it will tell you about it, sometimes it will just crash. Um, so don't just make your own implementation for this, drop it in and expect everything to go absolutely right. It'll keep breaking. Um, if your game has simple meshes, there's a much easier, much safer way to do an implementation for this, which is gizmos.drawmesh. Um, you probably want to set up a similar way to for your behaviors to specify what mesh should be drawn. But um, if you've only got simple static meshes or single mesh objects for most of your stuff, it's a much easier, much safer way to go about it, and it's actively supported by Unity. So that's an option that's available to you. So um, just jumping back to the Unity project, if this thing will let me. Um, OK, so basically, yes, this is the, the player model here. And when we're specifying the player model, um, I'm actually just going to jump. I think I might jump into the code for a second. Um, basically, as you can see, I've got the, each of the actors here, and they've included the preview model component. Um, so I'll, let's just make sure I can actually, there we go. I hope the text size, let's see if I can make the text size big enough. Okay, so coin pickup is implementing the iPreview model source um, interface, and that basically says, means that I have to implement this property here, which is, it will use to basically say what's, what's the current model. And it'll update this, any time I change this value, it'll, um, on the next update, it will replace the preview model. And then secondly, um, it implements this, uh, uh, it re requires that component. And this is just a nice way. The reason I'm, I'm showing you this is mostly just, even if you're going to use the gizmo option, um, this is a way that you don't have to go and set the preview model separate from what model you're really going to use. So it's, it's just the nicest way that I've found so far. And yeah, it basically what these characters, sorry, what I was also wanting to show there is that the preview model is actually not used in game. We actually go and inst we've got a model instance that we go and instantiate 
um, on awake. I probably should do that on start, but I'm being naughty. Um, okay, cool. So that's pretty much that. And just to show you that it doesn't all explode, there you go. Um, and in, now you can see in the hierarchy, these models actually exist. But when I'm viewing them in this, uh, in the edit mode, they don't exist. Well, they do, but they're hidden. You can't select them because of that uh, hide flags I'm using on them. And you can select them using a preview icon, which is just a gizmo. OK, so moving right along from there. Um, what is, uh, all right, back to this. So finally, now I get to be really angry. Behavior singletons. Um, so behavior singletons are usually used to represent a manager that should either be global or belong to like just one scene. They they're usually used as a like they're only usually used as singletons because they're easy to access. Like you can access the game system by like something something dot instance. Uh, but they're very rarely the kind of game system that really requires that they're only the single instance of this thing. And that's kind of where a lot of the problems start. So let's just make a replacement for that to begin with. So let's just make a really simple class. We make a script, it a scriptable object so we can go and save it to a file. Um, scriptable objects are, are nice that they don't actually automatically update or anything. Um, so we actually have to go and call all of those things ourselves. So we've got complete control over how these things are executed. Um, and just here's an example one. We've got like a player manager has the player prefab and it stores the current player. Um, it's got that create menu, uh, create asset menu attribute. So like if you right click, you'll have a little drop down menu to create that thing. So we can now create assets that store settings, but we haven't got a way to use them at runtime yet. So we need something that will manage our managers. And manager manager is the worst name I can possibly think of. So I went with manager container. Um, and uh, the code on the right is actually the first manager container I ever wrote. Um, this is I'm up to my fourth version now, and I've slowly been sort of trimming them down and making them more specific. Um, yes, all of this is on GitHub. No, version four. Oh yeah, version four. Yeah, yeah. This this one here is is not the one on GitHub. I'm just putting it here because if you wanted to read through the basic premise of like, it just instantiates all of the manager prefabs and then it calls like the full life cycle of functions on them. That's, that's basically what it's doing, but it's gonna get a lot more complicated from here because there's a couple more things that we can do here now that we've got complete control over them that make our life a lot easier in other ways. So it handles the full life cycle for these things, uh, but we still don't have a way to access them. And this is where it starts to get both pretty interesting and a lot more powerful. Um, yeah, so that was, as I said, that's just a basic manager container, for example. So now we have this concept of a function called get manager. And we implement get manager as uh, a member function in a base class for mono behavior that we use all throughout the project. Um, so the reason we do this is we don't want to use a static accessor for like directly accessing one instance via a singleton. We actually want to ask, uh, just get the one that is relevant to our current scene. So we have a, go, uh, a local method in each um, mono behavior, and we also use things like uh, extension methods to add it to other things. Um, and you call get manager just like you would a component. It's designed, like the idea is to match Unity's component methodology just as closely as possible. They're kind of like, the good way to think about managers is they're like components that are shared across your entire project, or rather shared across your entire scene. Um, we'll get to this, the idea of scenes in a bit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the way we're calling it. We've got base mono behavior, which is a mono behavior, implements get manager, which is a template function, which returns the manager that you've asked from the container. You'll notice it has a sneaky little scene parameter there where it's taking the game object's current scene and passing that in. That's when we get to global manager containers. That becomes very important. But there's a really important trick to get manager. Managers don't just call get manager like 
they aren't always given the manager. If you call get manager from one manager onto another, it will just return an error. It'll say dependency required. The reason here is that in order for one manager to access another manager, it needs to explicitly say that it depends on that manager. And basically, you need to depend on a manager whenever if you need, you need that other manager to operate. Now, this seems like overkill, but dependencies solve so many problems that it's amazing. Um, so for starters, we can sort our managers before instantiating them. In fact, we can just sort them no matter what. So all those problems where you had to figure out, oh, does the player manager initialize and execute before the unlocks manager? No, it, it does that for you. As long as you specify the dependencies, it can figure that out for you. Um, it, gives it, like, it gives it guaranteed correct initialization and update order, and you know what that order is going to be, because if you depend on something, it's going to get built before you, and it's going to get updated before you. And that's like, you can get something like that by changing script execution order numbers, but that's really, really difficult. The other thing is, it actually tells you if you have a cyclic dependency between one manager and another. So for instance, imagine you've got two managers, and one of them both of them need something from the other one's update, that's a cyclic dependency. One of them is going to get the, the results of that calculation one frame late. Now, quite often that's not a problem, but usually you find bugs caused by this that happen really late in development, like right before a build. It always happens right before a build. Something doesn't work. The game doesn't load in some circumstance or something like that. This thing gives you a warning when you've got one of those conditions. You don't have to go and find it. Um, so the concept of sorting is really quite easy. Um, you just do a depth first search through, like, through all the dependencies. So every single depend, uh, manager you're going to create, you, before you go and add it to the managers list, you go through and try and build each of its dependencies. And it doesn't matter which order you do it in, because when you try to build the dependency, it goes and then tries to build all its dependencies. And so essentially, it, you sort them as you create them. So yeah, basically, once you've visited all the dependencies for an item, add it to the sorted list. Um, this also is a great way to check for cyclic dependencies if you do this sorting step before you, um, you actually in initialize them. Um, secondly, we go and auto-construct them. If you don't have a manager, it will automatically build one. Um, this might be a little bit weird. People will be like, ah, uh, how do I, what happens if I don't have correct settings? But that's what we have global settings for. That's the purpose of that stuff. So your managers should be able to work regardless. They should have default settings that can run the game because we've already solved that problem. So if a, a manager is missing and you request it by get manager, or another, manage cont another manager is currently being constructed and it's a dependency for it, it will just be built. And the other thing is manager containers are also auto-constructed. So if you don't have a manager container in the scene and someone calls get manager, you instantly just build one. Um, OK, so I'm actually going to stop. Does anyone have any questions before we go any further? Because this is about to get like a step more complicated. Cool? All right, all right. So there is a problem here. This current implementation we've talked about so far doesn't handle the problem of having a system that's like a don't destroy or unload object. Because all of our managers so far live in a managed container that's part of our current scene, but we can only currently have one manager container under the current system. So we need to be able to handle more than one, and the best solution I've found to this is to have one special manager container that is the global manager container. Um, now, it works like this. It's the fallback. It's a don't destroy on load object. Whenever it gets executed, I'll get to the execution point next, but whenever you are looking for a manager, like as calling get manager, looking for a dependency, it gets checked last. The manager container in your current scene gets checked first. If it doesn't have anything, it then checks the, this one. It's kind of like the, the last point of call for all dependencies. But you can also access it directly. Say, say you want to always access particular manager from, from the don't destroy and load scope, you have a get global manager function for that. Um, and yeah, in terms of execution, it's always run first. It's always the, the point of the most dependence. 
Um, now this makes this system much more complicated to build, which is why we're not gonna look the source on slides because yeah, suddenly a lot of things get pretty nasty. But it manages, it makes the implementation use in games so much simpler. Suddenly, if you've got something that's needed across the whole game, you always ask for it as a global manager and it will just work. And if anything is present as a global manager and it's a dependency for something else, it just automatically finds it. It's, it's the global fallback. Uh, I can imagine situations where really large projects need a more complicated system than this, but if you're making a project that large, I'm pretty sure you've got enough staff to go and figure out that problem yourself. Um, okay, so I'll try to demo this. I haven't, I'm not really happy with the best way that I've found so far to show this off, but uh, okay, so let's quickly go in here. So currently this, uh, here's my hierarchy window. I don't have, I have an example manager container that's not a global manager container and it's got our example player manager in the game. Now, our player manager requires the score manager. Um, I can just quickly pull up the source code to show you that. Oh, it's written here. So, uh, Oh, sorry, that's the player settings. This screen down here is really bad. <coughs> okay. Anyway, so I, when I press play, we look in here, and you can see it's gone and created the example player manager we specified as a prefab. Um, we can tweak the values in here. These are actually instances, so they won't be saved when the, uh, the game quits. The reason being that like, we're creating the instances so that we have local data. We don't want to sort of save out anything that we were doing while playing. They're sort of... They are literally like components, but they're shared. Um, and it had a score manager dependency, and, and you can see that that one's been auto-constructed because it, we didn't have it in the scene. Um, if we went and added an example score manager in here, notice that I'm adding it in the wrong order. It'll automatically sort them for us and go and put them in correctly. So like, this is just a, a good way to replace your, all your singletons. Like, I have not found a case where I couldn't, I now need to use a behavior singleton despite this. Um, and now I have a lot more flexibility. For instance, um, pooling was the biggest win. Uh, I can have an object pool per level. And that pool gets initialized when the level loads, gets deinitialized when the level gets destroyed. Um, all of the objects belong to the scene, so it behaves like the scene normally would. A lot, like, you probably will have problems if you do pooling with behave, with normal singletons because you've got to keep track of multiple pools, one pool per scene. Well now, you don't have to have a manager that does that, you've got one manager per scene. It's nat the natural way to solve this problem. And as you go through this, you suddenly realize that a lot of your behavior singletons are really dumb solutions to problems. It's just the only, it's like you only had a hammer. <coughs> suddenly everything became a nail. Okay, sorry, uh, moving along. There's really not much more you can demo on a, a thing like that, I'm afraid. Um, oh, more demo time. Um, well, shit. Um, is there anything anyone wanted to see more about or uh, have any questions about while we're demoing things before we just throw it open to wide questions? No. Oh, yes? Yes. Uh, that's something I've, I've just, uh, in these classes here, each, like the actor player and the coin, in both cases, they, both of those classes just instantiate it as a child themselves. Um, the preview object, yes, it always instantiates it as a child as well. Um, you could do it at runtime. I, I might need to, have a longer discussion with you after this to try and understand the, the problem you're, you're talking about because I'm not really sure I understand the case you're, you're talking about. Um, look, let's, um, if no, one, no one's uh, worried about the, the demo, let's just jump right onto the um, questions. If I can actually get the slide to cross. Questions! Um, all right, does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff in here? We've only got about five minutes for questions. Yep. Um, regarding the model, Okay, I always use um, the, the I look up the bones by their names. 
And generally, I go one step further, and I create an asset that has no data in it, and I use that as like, it's called like a bone lookup. And I'll have a bone lookup called, I, uh, called ik underscore hand right, and there'll be bones in the characters called I unders ik underscore hand right. And you basically say, you put this thing in, it just counts as a string. You just use the name of the asset, and um, that's the way that you look them up. So you, you calculate those things at startup, basically. Uh, sorry, somebody else had their hand up? Yep. Yes, um, I generally vary that project to project quite a lot, but I've got a couple of things that I will often have my UI broke out into a separate scene and load it after something else, just so that it's always the same between other, other scenes. Um, I don't like having a, a setting scene, uh, but I do like to having a concept of like uh, global global configuration and stuff like that. I generally try to keep levels, up until Unity 5, I tried to keep levels in one scene and I would actually merge my scenes. So it would have, the scene would be broken up in ten, like for example, 10 rooms. And then when you press play, it would actually merge them together. Unfortunately, the workaround that I used for that was broken uh, when Unity 5 came out. There are plugins that let you do that. And so I kind of, I like loading levels as one scene. It keeps things relatively simple and then you have sort of layers of other things you bring in. Um, I guess really it, it comes down to what kind of game you're trying to work with and what kind of technical problems the scenes will create. Because the new scene manager is a little bit error prone in a lot of these things, um, especially if you want to change the active scene. So um, it's, there's no one golden rule of how I like to do this. I, try, I look at the problem and I really try and figure out what the scene manager can do and where I can avoid most problems. Sorry if that's a bit nebulous, but I don't have one answer for that question. Um, yes? Yeah, generally what I do is I try and find the reason that dependency has become cyclic, and I break it out, break that section out to become something that's dependent on both the other managers, or in some cases it only requires that it's a dependency on one of them. But usually you've got something that's doing two tasks, and now it's dependent on two different managers. And they're generally not that difficult to fix, except it's really late in development, you've got no time to refactor. Um, but the advantage of this system is that it will tell you about that cyclic dependency the minute that you write it. Like the minute that you press play, it'll say, there's a cyclic dependency here. So, so you, yes, if you've got a cyclic dependency uh, and you can avoid it, you should most definitely avoid it because it will come back to bite you. Uh, I've just got like two minutes left. Does anyone have like one last question? Uh, sure. If I can ask you, you've been using Unity for 30 years. How well has your frameworks held out over the years. Um, I have two categories of frameworks. I've got the ones that I will show you in talks like this, and then I've got the ones that I use and hope that they don't break. Uh, so yeah, there are some things which will definitely break. I had a, actually had a game where I could not port it from Unity 4 because my framework, like, like I mentioned with the scene merging stuff, um, to rework all the levels in that game was just a monolithic task, and so forever that game will just live on Unity 4. Um, so yeah, it's not always, these frameworks often will have problems, but generally what I do is I cut away and keep a sort of core set of features which will work no matter what Unity does because they sort of keep to the spirit of how Unity works, and they generally use safe features to operate. So yeah, there are definite dangerous features, but I would not, be in a, <laughs> telling you about them in a talk like this. Um, cool. I think that's it.